How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern. Well, it's Friday here on the show, and we got a lot to talk about here today. Not the least of which is uh, yesterday. If you hear the show yesterday, we do have a new stipulation for Battle in the Valley tomorrow. As uh, in the middle of the show, we had a back and forth with Eddie Kingston and Jay White. And uh, both of them agreed that tomorrow it is essentially loser leaves New Japan. Jay White loses. He can never wrestle for New Japan again. Actually, I don't know if that was the exact stipulation, but he's gone from New Japan. And uh, and I guess if Eddie Kingston loses, he can no longer wrestle anybody anywhere from New Japan without permission from Jay White. So that stipulation is official after yesterday. And uh, that does mean that uh, we don't have either guy on the show here today. So uh, fear not, Hammerstone will be on the show in the final segment. We'll talk to him about all sorts of different topics. I never let you down. I always have a guest my main man, Hammerstone's going to be on the show today, so that's going to be fun. We have the lineup for the Battle in the Valley show. We have the lineup for the WWE Elimination Chamber show tomorrow. Who's going to win all these matches? We'll talk about that here today. We have also got two things, two things I really want to talk about today. One will not take long. One is going to take a little longer. One of them is the, uh, the story of... You'll never guess. Vince McMahon wants to sell WWE. That news came out on Friday, huh? And uh, also, I want to say a little bit about the the Dynamite ratings and what they mean to me. So uh, then we've got the rest of the news as well. And uh, if you want to text us here today, 425-780-7566. That is 425-780-7566. Brian at WrestlingObserver.com. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Ah, uh, get this out of the way first because it'll take like two seconds. I can't help but note that I predicted this was going to happen. Every week, some news happens to leak about how a WWE sale is inevitable. And we got a new one today. Just happened on a Friday that Bloomberg has a story that Vince is looking for $9 billion dollars. For a WWE sale. And they have many people interested. It's going to be like this every week. Every week some story is going to break, leak, whatever. To keep it in the news that WWE is close to a sale. Now I want to make this abundantly clear. I'm not saying this isn't true. I'm not saying that he doesn't want $9 billion. I'm not saying that they don't have suitors. I'm sure he wants $9 billion. I'm sure they do have suitors. But every week, something is going to leak to remind investors that we are close on a sale. Because when this goes out of the news cycle, the stock is going to drop. So every week, we got another one. And here we go. Here's a new one today. He wants $9 billion. Probably get it for all I know. I'm now, guessing that that news break broke about uh, an hour or so ago because I'm looking at the stock price for the day and I see it has spiked at approximately oh 145 or so. So yes, eighty nine dollars thirty four cents a share right now, up two percent. Mm. Well, next week I'm sure there will be another story that comes out about this sale. Now, mm. let's talk about uh, something here that people get whatever about. So just Here's my recommendation. Just listen and don't freak out till I'm done. Listen to what I have to say here, okay? So this is not even about the specific rating on Wednesday. This is a, this is a larger thing that we see a lot, okay? Dynamite on Wednesday did 824,000 viewers, down 8%, the lowest audience for the show since November 16. 18 to 49, fourth on cable, 0.27, down 10%, and the second lowest 18 to 49 of the year to date. Okay? Now, please listen carefully. Fourth on cable. That's great. Okay? It'd be better if it were first, but there's nothing wrong with being fourth on cable. Is this a catastrophic rating? No, it's not a catastrophic rating. 
Is the demo catastrophic? No, it's not. Okay? But Rampage, I don't want to say he's been doing catastrophic numbers, but Rampage is doing very bad numbers. Okay? And we talk about it a lot. And why is Dynamite not doing great numbers? Well, because they don't do big matches on that show. They do, every now and then a big star will be on the show, but they will be facing somebody that, with or without a robot telling you the lineup, you inevitably know who is going to win. It is an A-level star versus a B or C or D-level star, and the show is not doing well, okay? Dynamite. Dynamite, and Dave has mentioned this a thousand times, Dave always looks at the Dynamite lineup, and he looks at the lineup, and he will say before the show goes on if he thinks the show's going to do well or if it's not going to do well. And why does he make that that uh, the suggestion? Because he looks at the, the lineup. What is the lineup for the show? Are there a lot of big marquee matches on the show? If there are, the show usually does well. And if there aren't, the show usually does not do well, okay? And when you looked at the lineup for Dynamite this week, this was not a big marquee lineup. I think we can all agree on that. And the show did 824,000 viewers and a .27, which are, are not great Dynamite numbers. What's my point, okay? My point. Once again, please listen. There is a narrative of late. There's two narratives. One is if they don't break a million, they're doing horrible. Like a, a million is some magical number. That if they cross one million, things are great. If they go below one million, things are horrible. Even if it's like 999,000, we see these, oh, it wasn't a million. That's one narrative. The other narrative is that there are no stories in AEW. WWE tells stories, and AEW does not tell stories. They just book matches. There's no storylines, okay? This is not true. There are storylines. Now, here is my point. I am not saying that there are no storylines. But what I am saying, what I have determined from all of this, is that the stories that they are telling, the stories that they are telling are significantly less important to the current AEW fan base than the matches themselves. In other words, these fans want to see these big matches, and they will watch the show and they will understand, for the most part, the storylines. But understanding the storylines and being invested in the storylines are two completely different things. There have been many times where I review the show and I go, I'm not quite sure what's going on here. And then, you know, the real hardcores will get on me. You weren't paying attention. You missed this. You missed that. The story makes sense. Well, maybe I missed something. But. The storyline making sense, whether you pay attention or you don't pay attention, it's, it's irrelevant. The story making sense, that's not the same as do people care about the storylines. Now, the big difference between WWE and AEW is this. What's on SmackDown tonight? I'll tell you in a minute, but most of you listening probably have no idea what matches are on the show tonight. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. But the reality is, whether you know or you don't know, and whether you find out or you don't, the WWE fans, whether they care about the matches on SmackDown tonight or not, they are going to watch it because they want to know what's next in certain storylines. They are more invested in these storylines than the matches. Whereas with AEW, if the AEW, and we see this from Rampage, and now we saw it here with Dynamite, if they don't care about the lineup for the show, there are a percentage of them who don't care enough about the storylines to tune in to find out what's how the storylines are going to progress. MJF storyline with Brian Danielson. 
I think they're doing a, a fairly good job with the storyline. It's not perfect. But if you look at the quarter hours, the MJF Brian Danielson storyline literally did exactly at the show average. I mean, it just did it just did the show average. It didn't do exceptionally good. It did not do exceptionally bad. So the fans that looked at the lineup for Dynamite and they were like, eh, you know, it's whatever. I mean, the matches are fine, but there's nothing I really want to see. They did not decide, well, I'm still going to watch the show because I want to know what's going on with the MGF Brian Danielson storyline. They are not invested in that storyline or any of the other storylines to the degree that WWE fans are invested in the WWE storylines. So this is not an issue of there are no storylines. This is not even an issue of is the storyline good or is the storyline bad? Because that is for each individual wrestling fan to determine on their own it's subjective but what is not subjective is there is less investment in those storylines amongst AEW fans than there is among WWE fans so how you remedy this what you do I don't know but I think that that's very clear from looking at these numbers this is not a one-time thing this is you can look back at lineups and the way that the AEW fans react to those lineups and you can see that they're there for the matches. They're not there for the storylines. They may like them. They may not like them. But they are not there for them. They're there for the matches. I think you can apply that to the talent roster itself. You know, you really can. For all of the love that people have for MJF or Hangman Page or Moxley, do they feel larger than life right now? How many characters have they created? How many new people have there been to get behind? So that plays into part of this as well. More on this with the mic after the break. Observer Live. All right, back in the show. Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Video bloke saying the uh, audio's low, so I uh, adjusted some stuff. So uh, let me know how it sounds now. Brothers? All right. Anything you want to add? No. Okay. I actually expected people would be like all crazy, but you know, the the chat here. Lots of good listeners. Oh, you're good friends in the chat? Well, you know, it depends. Your good close personal friends in the chat, the same way you have good close personal friends named Eddie and Jay, and now one of them are gonna lose some income. And now Hammerstone. Of you. Hammerstone. I want to make this abundantly clear. This is not my fault. None of this is my fault. If you want to blame somebody, you can blame Dom. Because Dom, Dom. should have known better. He should have known better than the patch patch arrival through in the middle of someone else's interview. And he should have just said, us. Eddie, Eddie, he should have just said, we have someone else on the show. We will rebook you for tomorrow. That's what he should have done. We never take calls on that line ever. I don't know why he answered the phone. I make it abundantly clear, don't answer that phone. I don't like the byline phones. I like... My daughter doesn't either. No. Don't, uh, you know, don't, uh, I'll handle the calls here. What is he doing handling the calls? What the hell's going on in that house? I don't know. My uh, daughter is out there. Oh, God. Shoot family on the, uh, I may. Shoot moments on the radio here. Yeah. But yeah, so uh, we, uh, yeah, Dom really getting the dig in on us as well, too, there in the uh, process of leading to that. But I guess, you know, it did make for good radio. I'm still not sure if it's the best thing for the careers of these two gentlemen. I can't see any scenario whatsoever where if Eddie Kingston loses this match, he would be down on bended knee. He would be picking up a phone. He would be texting any of that stuff for Jay White for anything, for a damn thing. So... That's I can't see that happening. I'm worried right now for Eddie Kingston and Jay White. Why? I don't know. Did she stop screaming? I, was I, keep I think going so. Until, okay. I don't. I don't feel. I don't feel bad for either of them because you should. Uh, you're cause of this. So so you're you're gonna you know when you say that what you're saying is that these are untalented men who if they lose this match have no prospects in this business. No, what I'm I don't saying feel bad is, for them at all. Eddie said it himself. I'm gonna make money. It don't matter if, I mean, he says Rocky can fire him. He says Tony can fire him. It doesn't yeah. matter. He's going to make money in this business. And yeah. so will Jay White. 
There's a difference so between long money, Brian, and short money. I think you know that better than anything. You don't even, like, move in the morning unless somebody's, like, flashing $5,000 in your face for you to get up and do anything. And Eddie Kingston does have the opportunity to make money. He could make money anywhere he wanted to. But you know where he couldn't make money? He couldn't make it in New Japan because he's not the type of guy that's going to actually have to sit there and ask for permission from a guy well, like work, Jay White. A guy that didn't even know my name. Work for a Noah. guy that did dare to insult me eddie kingston wouldn't ask that man for nothing and i don't blame him for it hey we got uh we got some lineups here so tonight in uh in uh wherever yeah you know montreal's got ice storms and snow and the schools are canceled so hopefully everyone gets to the show tonight Ooh. uh we've got gunther versus madcap moss for the intercontinental title ronda rousey and Shayna baszler versus natty and shotzi and Drew and Sheamus versus the Viking Raiders. Asuka is also facing Liv Morgan. That's the lineup for SmackDown here tonight. It's probably going to do about 2.5 million viewers because, of course... Hey, it might do better than that if the weather's bad in the Northeast, so... Sammy has know. been told not to be at the show or at the show tomorrow. You think he ain't going to be there tonight? You think he ain't going to be in Montreal tonight? Hump! I guess we're going to... Well, I know the Usos have been told, not Sammy, obviously. Yeah, well, yeah. And then, of course, we have got uh, two big shows this weekend. The uh, Battle in the Valley, which you can watch on Fight, I believe. Alex Coughlin, J.R. Kratos, David Finley, and Bobby Fish. Masker Dorada, Josh Alexander, Adrian Quest, Rocky Romero against Kushida, Volador Jr., Kevin Knight, and the DKC. Fred Rosser and Kenta. Motor City Machine Guns versus the West Coast Wrecking Crew. Jay White and Eddie Kingston. Loser Leaves New Japan. Tom Lawler, Homicide, Filthy Rules. Zack Sabre Jr., Clark Connors for the TV title. Kyrie versus Mercedes for the IWGP women's title. And Okada versus Tanahashi for the IWGP world heavyweight title. All of those matches taking place on Saturday night. And, of course, that's head-to-head -head with the Elimination Chamber with a chamber match. Theory, Seth Rollins, Gargano, Bronson Reed, Damian Priest, and uh, who's the other guy? Anyway, that's uh, then we got Oscar, Lib Morgan, Nikki Cross, Raquel, Natty, and Carmella for the uh, women's title. Uh, actually, for the shot at the women's title. So the winner of that match faces Bianca. So uh, hopefully it's Oscar. Roman Reigns, Sammy for the title. Edge and Beth versus Finn and Rhea, and Bobby Lashley versus Brock Lesnar. That is the lineup. For Elimination Chamber. And uh, I predict Theory retains. I predict Asuka wins. I predict, yes, Roman Reigns leaves with the title. I'll say that. Edge and Beth win. And I predict a no contest of some sort. Some shenanigans in Lesnar versus Lashley to lead to a last man standing or something like that at uh, WrestleMania with those two behemoths what are your thoughts i predict montez ford is going to do something insane inside that elimination chamber That's i'm sure he's going to jump sure off about. something high i have a feeling yeah hopefully it's not too dangerous but no i mean i kind of really echo your sentiments there i think it'll be a really fun match with the environment watching Sami Zayn and roman reigns you know not to say that it won't be a good match but i'm I got to be honest, I'm more interested in what happens next, to be honest. You know, what happens at the end of that match? How does it end? Where do they go from there? Who gets involved? Who comes out? I'm really, really interested in that because when you have a storyline like that, and I know DJ's in the chat right now, I know, great storytelling. Yes, it has been great storytelling, and it does have me invested Which in Which ones he's mad on. about? I don't know. I think about the Roman Reigns bloodline storyline. Well, that one's great. I think it is. Yes, that one's quite Not great. everybody likes it, though. I understand. Well, People think it's a little heavy-handed. I understand. Heavy-handed? Yeah. Who's, who? You You complain about the people in my timeline. What are you well, talking about? Uh, the, look, you, you've complained great about these story. people, too. The people for the last two years who have said, Roman Reigns, he's dominated everything. It's been too much. It's been too overwhelming. Too much Roman Reigns. There are people who believe that. Hmm. WWE considering plans to bring Carmelo Hayes to the main roster, according to The Observer. Well, they should, him and Trick. 
They got to bring him up as a duo. It doesn't matter if Trick's not ready. It doesn't matter. He doesn't need to wrestle all the time. He can still train, but they're a duo. And if you need him to get squashed, you can. Have him keep training. Have him keep matching, doing matches in uh, NXT. Who cares? I mean, I'm sure they all live in the area. So uh, the I don't know if this is actually what's going to happen, but I, I had heard that there was a decent chance that the winner of the Braun Breaker Carmelo Hayes match would be champion, and the loser would end up on the main roster, uh, which of course suggests Carmelo Hayes. But hey, you could uh, bring up Braun Breaker as well. Depends on you know what they want to do with either well, on guy. On paper, it's a completely believable storyline because both guys could actually be on the main roster right this second. So it does actually create some legit doubt. Trick Williams is not the whole act. Come on. He is no oh, come on. Come Trick on. is fantastic. But let's not be silly here when Carmelo is you know, he's he's the future. Look, look at him and Montez and again Grayson Waller. They have a bunch of guys that, if treated correctly and treated right for the next ten years, are gonna carry the company, men and women. And then uh we got a name change. And uh you know, I, I don't usually like this thing about how so and so doesn't have a last name and I was glad when they gave Theory his name back and everything like that. But uh, I actually don't mind this one because the person is Ava Rain. Ava Rain is now just Ava, okay? Now, I understand wanting to carve your own path, okay? I understand that. But you also have the daughter of... Of The Rock, the daughter of Dwayne Johnson, the daughter of the biggest movie star on the planet and one of the biggest wrestling superstars of all time. And you're calling her Ava Rain. So I'm not saying you need to call her like Ava Johnson or whatever. But if you call her Ava, I can pretend her last name is Johnson. I can pretend she's the daughter of The Rock. So I'm fine with her just being Ava. This one does not bother me. Pebbles? I don't know about Pebbles, but... Uh... Well, you know what? That's still a better name than Eddie Thorpe. And I'm old. I'm pushing 50. Oh, yeah. So... That's a new name of Carl Fredericks. Yeah, Eddie when was, Thorpe. When I was young, they would talk about Jim Thorpe being one of the greatest athletes of the 20th century, maybe the greatest athlete of the first 50 years of the 20th century, but... I think since my generation has grown up, I think Jim Thorpe is a name that I don't know if anybody knows, and I don't know if that's where they got it from. They're spelling Eddie as if it was Eddie Guerrero, E-D-D-Y. They're using that spelling, so I don't know if he's taking, if they're taking from two elements and putting them together, but I got to be honest, no offense to Carl Fredericks, that sounds like a very NXT name. Well, actually, you know what? I would disagree. I th- when I that? saw the name, I was like, oh, of course he's Eddie Thorpe. <laughs> like, But of when you think about is? it, a normal bad NXT name is when you give them two first names, okay? At least they gave him a first name and a last name. Fair. His name yeah. is Eddie Thorpe, okay? But at least they gave him a first name and a last name. He could have been like, you know, Eddie Mike or something like that. That'd be, that'd be more <laughs> of an NXT name. <laughs> Mike you know Eddie. it's not an NXT name? Hammerstone! Hell we'll be no. back in a moment with him, Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Elvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. Very happy today <laughs> to be joined by a champion. A world champion, MLW champion, Hammerstone, joining us here today. Hammerstone, how you doing? I'm doing great, guys. Thanks for having me. All right. Obviously, the uh, big story out of MLW is the new Reels deal, which uh, just debuted, I think, uh, two weeks ago now, actually. And uh, what can you tell us about uh, the jump to Reels? Yeah, I mean, uh, so far, uh, it's looking like a really awesome thing. Uh, You know, MLW on a new network, uh, that's a lot more accessible to a lot of people. You know, I know we've bounced around from different streaming services and different uh, little channels in the past, um, but now we have a new home on Reels. And, um, yeah, it looks like I I, I can say for sure that we have some really good television filmed and ready to go, and the stuff we're going to be showing in the next couple weeks is going to be some really can't-miss stuff. It's some of the most, uh, most proud I've been of the product this far. 
Hammerstone, I got to ask you, if there was anybody on the MLW roster who may make an appearance on Reels' other favorite show, On Patrol Live, who would it be? Oh. <laughs> Man, I got uh, I got to say uh, the Simone SWAT team. Those boys, uh, those boys <laughs> seem like they get in trouble uh, pretty, pretty often. Uh, we'll, we'll get back to the shows and uh, be getting back to the hotel and uh, – those guys are still venturing out in the middle hours of the night, so who knows what kind of trouble they're getting into. Well, you know, i got to ask you about Fatu for a second, because I don't think that there's anybody who is more recognized with MLW than yourself and Jacob Fatu. As you enter this new era of MLW on reels and another possibility for a start, you know, how does it feel being the flag bearer and the, the guy carrying the torch for this product? You know, it, it feels uh, it feels incredible, and um, you know, um, like you mentioned, myself and Jacob Fatu, uh, a lot of people would call us one and one A, um, and, and you could say who's who. Uh, I like to believe in my own head, I'm, I'm number one. Um, but that being said, you know, I saw him win the World Heavyweight Championship before me, and uh, he was a friend, um, so I was glad to see it. But you know, we've always been kind of rivals there, um, and now. It just so happens to coincide that um, with our real debut, we're gearing up uh, towards a rematch in the in the upcoming future, and uh, I think it's going to be an incredible match. I think it's going to draw some incredible numbers, um, and to be part of that and uh, just leading the charge and to have that as one of, like the first big fuse we're building towards, um, it's pretty incredible. It's a pretty humbling experience. You know, outside of the uh, the stories and everything like that, I don't like to break kayfabe here on the show, but uh, this uh, this fat too is awesome. I mean, just incredible worker, and uh, you know, you obviously you won the title from him. But how many how many matches would you say you guys have had together? And and you know, what have you what have you learned working with him? Um. You know, we really haven't had as many matches as you might expect. We did work a couple places um, before ever getting to MLW. We worked with each other at APW up in Northern California. We wrestled in Portland for a uh, little local television out there. Um, and then in MLW, we've besides the singles match we had, I think we were involved in triple threat, and that's maybe it. You know, So it really hasn't been that we crossed paths as much as someone might expect. But like you, you know, like you alluded to, he's one of the absolute best in the world, in my opinion. One of the best I've been in the ring with. He's incredible. Um, the things he could do, like the natural talent he has, is just insane. Um, so I think the thing that I learned from him, and uh, is that there are guys around me who have that level of talent almost just bred into them. So for a guy like myself, who maybe when I first got into the wrestling ring, I had two left feet and, uh, you know, didn't know a wrist watch from a wrist lock. Uh, it means I have to work a lot harder to stay at the top. It means that there's going to be guys like that always coming, always gunning for my spot and uh, always trying to, you know, try to become the king of MLW. So I got to be able to keep up with them. I got to work hard. I got to I got to never let up. This is going to be your 10th year in wrestling 2023 and uh you know as i look at the last two years uh maybe three four years when i look at the level of talent that you've you've either feuded with or uh shared the ring with in some way laredo kid aerostar la park mil mascaris filthy tom uh jacob fat two king muertes black taurus pagano I mean, it really seems like in the last, you know, three, four years, uh, you've just had the opportunity to work with, like, a giant, like, a lot of really, really talented guys. Uh, is, is Would you say that that's kind of the case? And, and do you feel that you have really, uh, I guess, improved exponentially in that period because of working with those guys? Yeah, I mean, um, I think, uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to start that trend a, a little bit sooner than that um where you know promoters finally started you know taking a chance to put me in the ring with some of the bigger name uh talent that was doing the indies at the time and then getting into mlw it really like you alluded to it really just opened those floodgates where i was able to get matches with top guys from around the world um and yeah that that has uh that has 
leveled me up in, in two regards. Um, simply being in the ring, every once in a while being in the ring with the, someone who's just super phenomenal, it like it's a learning experience. You know, like when I wrestled Davey Richards for the first time, like I felt better just from that one match. Or when I wrestled Mara Fuji, from, I met, felt better after that one match. Um, but the flip side to that is like I was saying – just being in the ring with guys like that on a consistent, regular basis means that you have to constantly be, you know, on your game. It means that you, you're you going to embarrass yourself if you show up to a match, you know, unready, undisciplined, not in shape, any of those things. Um, so that being said, yeah, it's helped me in both those regards. You uh, recently had a chance to tour NOAA, and uh, w- was that your first uh, excursion to Japan? It was my third time in Japan, actually, but um, it was my first time that I was out there for like an extended stay because I was out there for about six weeks. So that was the longest I'd spent out there. You know, every time somebody spends their uh, first extended excursion in Japan, I have to ask this question because I've asked many people over the years, and it seems like there's uh, it's one or the other. You either spent six weeks there, and like old filthy Tom, you you just want to move there and never come back, or it's like it's an, it's enough of a culture shock that's like, ah, eh, you know, I'll do it. It's good money. I enjoy the the wrestling aspect, but I'm ready to go back home. Yeah, I did my time there. Yes. Which 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 camp would you fall into? I'm definitely the second because I like my routine i like my comforts um like it was um i really had to mentally prepare myself to go there just to know that i wasn't going to be able to eat the certain foods at the certain times and always go to the, my certain gym and all of these things and uh just kind of the routine you get used to um just to know i was gonna have to break that so extremely um i had to like really mentally prepare myself for that um I remember, like, this is not even a joke. Uh, one of my suitcases I brought was basically like freeze dried chicken and protein powder and rice packets because I was just like so paranoid about not being able to get food when I needed it. Um, but that being said, I love it over there. Um, the culture shock, it's a good thing. And I really like to go into that zone for a certain burst of time in my life, you know, to, to have six weeks where I'm like, I'm so deep in wrestling where all i do is eat train sleep wrestle repeat like it's you know you kind of go into warrior mode it's a similar vibe as when i you know decide to do a bodybuilding competition it's just something that for a period of time you get extra focused for a specific reason um but that being said i don't want to spend my whole year like that um so after the six weeks i was ready to come home but now that i've been home for you know, you know what? Two years now, I'm ready to go back. So, it, it, it's it's somewhere in the in the middle. How hard does Takashi Sugiura hit? Because I've been watching him for years. I watched him in have shoot fights. I, I've watched him all over the place. And in that N1 victory tournament, you came out on the other end against him, which you know, hey, a lot of people have. But what was it like being in the ring with a guy who really is a legend? Uh, dude, it was uh, man, it was incredible. Uh, I will say one of the funny um, things is um, he came up to me before we wrestled and he was looking at me like he wanted to say something, but he doesn't speak English. And he grabbed one of the guys who could translate and he said something to him and then walked away. And the guy walked over to me and he goes, he says, if you're going to hit him with that boot, you better freaking hit him with it. (laughs) And I guess like I'd thrown a weak boot the night before. So I, I would re wrestle. I drilled him across the face with it. Um, But yeah, he's a, He's a hard-hitting, tough guy, and especially considering he's freaking 50 years old. Um, but that was one of the coolest parts um, was after that match with him, the next morning I was at uh, breakfast with one of the bookers for Noah, and uh, he said, Sagura came to the office last night after the show, and he said that we should bring you back on the next tour. So I was like, oh, man, like what a what a nice little feather in the cap to have earned, uh, earned that guy's respect. But I will uh, add this because you're talking about a hard hitter. Shiyazaki and his chops were the hardest I got hit in the, my entire stay in Japan. So that was still the worst. Now, when you when you talk about liking to stay in your comfort zone, I mean, it seems to me that during your uh, your early independent career, it was uh, it was primarily West Coast. Uh, a lot of stuff in, in uh, Arizona, Vegas, California, Oregon. 
I mean, was that kind of the same deal? Uh, were you just kind of comfortable staying a little closer to home, or or what happened there? Well, no. I mean, I, it's not about staying in a comfort zone. It's about having a routine available to me. If anything, in sure. I don't. I don't want to be in a comfort zone. I want to be doing new things. Um, that being said, in the early years, like yeah, um, it, it was just getting anywhere I could, anywhere that would have me. Um, and I was I was very lucky to get some opportunities. But yeah, basically anything that was drivable meant uh, California, Vegas, uh, Utah, um, Texas. And then I started getting flown out. The first places I was getting flown out, I went to Canada my first couple of years. I went to uh, up in the Northwest and Oregon. Um, but and then basically by you know 2015. I started to crack into the the realm where different promoters were flying me around the country. And then obviously wrestling is one of those things where everyone's scared to be the first to take a chance on a guy. And once somebody's the first to do it in an area, it kind of snowballs and it's just kind of grown rapidly from there. But um, I've always been the type where I want to get new places. I don't like doing the same thing for too long. I start to feel stuck. Now you also mentioned that early on you felt like you had two left feet. And uh, what what was it that uh, solved that problem, so to speak? I mean, was it just repetition? Were there uh, other things that you did or were recommended to do? What what got you feeling comfortable in the ring? Um, I, I just had really good trainers, uh, to be honest. Um, and I worked really, really hard in the beginning. Um, when I first showed up to wrestling school, like I had spent years, you know, trying to build up my body because before wrestling I was very skinny very scrawny so I spent a long time building up my body because I thought like oh you had to be a big jack guy to be a wrestler and then I showed up my first day of wrestling school and all these guys I got super blown up I couldn't do the roles I could barely run the ropes um, but it was just repetition and not quitting and also having trainers who were very good at explaining things when I was not getting them uh, I was just very fortunate in uh, having a patient trainer who was very good at explaining things and me being very stubborn and not willing to quit all right stand by back in a moment with more everybody wrestling observer live back in the show brian alvarez here wrestling observer live mike semper vb also of wrestlingobserver.com hammerstone joining us here today don't forget mlw underground wrestling airs every tuesday at 10 o'clock eastern and pacific on reels and uh, if you go to the website, uh, reels.com, or the MLW website, there's information about how you can get reels if you do not have it already. And Hammerstone, let's get some uh, plugs in for anything you got upcoming, social media, etc. Yeah, I mean, just follow me on social media. I'm at Alex Hammerstone on Instagram and Twitter, Alexander Hammerstone on Facebook. And uh, I'll be keeping all the updates with all my upcoming shows, everything MLW, where to get the merch, where to catch the matches. And uh, the big one uh, just announced was myself versus Yamato is coming up uh, for the MLW World Heavyweight Championship on Reels. And if I survive that, then Jacob Fatu versus Alexander Hammerstone, number two, is on the horizon, the match people have been waiting for for a very long time. Um, So if you haven't checked out MLW, now is the best time to get started. Well, I want to thank you so much for doing the show today, and best of luck with everything. And uh, make sure you check out MLW on Reels, everybody, Tuesdays at 10 Eastern and Pacific. And we are going to wrap it up here for today. Don't forget this weekend, we got Elimination Chamber. we got New Japan Battle in the Valley. We'll be talking about that coming up this weekend as well with uh, Dave, Vinny, etc. And uh, you can check it out, WrestlingObserver.com, as well as video.f4wonline.com. And uh, that is it from here. So I want to thank Mike, as always. Callers and listeners, everybody at the studio, Hammerstone. We'll talk to you again next time, Wrestling Observer Live.